Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and I think I've got a pretty good video for you tonight. Tonight I'm going to cover five guitar players that I think are vastly underrated. Oh, you'll find plenty of articles on these guitarists, positive articles, all covering the fact that they're all great guitar players and they've got their riffs in order. But when it comes to lists, these guitar players often don't rank as high as those articles would seem to indicate. You know, we're going to talk about a couple of different aspects of guitar playing tonight. And one of those things that I want to cover is tone. You've heard the term tone chasers, and there are guitarists that are known to be very particular about the tones that they incorporate with their guitar and their amp and any boxes in between. They are known to get different sounds out of their guitar to achieve a greater sound for the band that they're in, or at least in that particular recording, they're attempting to lay down. Well, all five of these guitarists are tone chasers in every sense of the word, and we'll talk further about that. But there's another word that I don't hear very often brought up, and that is a guitarist vocabulary. You see, I've heard a zillion guitarists out there playing the same riffs, playing the same riffs in the same fashion, and thinking they've accomplished something because they turned this riff upside down and married it to this. But it's all still fairly linear thinking, and it's a linear approach, and not bad. There's some great guitarists out there that follow this approach. But when I talk about a guitarist vocabulary, that's a rare thing, folks. I have worked with, personally, some fabulous guitars, but I can only think of three guitarists that I have met that actually have a guitar vocabulary. Okay, so let me explain to you what I mean about a guitar vocabulary. That's the rare guitarist to me, who is quite versed in all the riffs and everything but they somehow can turn those riffs and go into directions you never thought they would even think of. This is just one reason why I choose Jimmy Page as my favorite guitarist of all time. It is his vocabulary more than just his dexterity. All right, so before we get on to the first guitarist that I wanted to cover tonight, I did want to thank all of our viewers. You know, the channel has grown so much just in the last month or two. You know, my very first video was October 28th. As of today, that was exactly five months ago. And I've kept all my videos up, so you can go back and search those videos, and you'll know that the focus of this channel originally was a tech channel. Go back far enough in my videos and you'll see me giving tutorials and how to edit YouTube videos. But you know, as geeky as I am and as much as I like technology and sharing knowledge and all of that, it just wasn't quite me. But all of that changed when Peter Jackson released Get Back, a reworking basically of the Let It Be movie, but with a ton more footage. My rock and roll roots grabbed out to me. I did that video and surprisingly, it did very well. Now you think I would have gotten the hint. Ah. Oh. People like that kind of video, but I still spend another month or two waffling back and forth with an occasional Beatle video and the original content as well, right? Well, as you know, the whole focus of the channel has completely changed. And once I was able to get that focus into view, things have just really taken off. And with the help of a couple of fellow channels, the channel has just soared. So a great big thank you to all of you viewers. I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. All right, I'm getting sentimental here. So anyway, let's get back to the focus of the video. Okay, so I'm going to cover these guys in no particular order, as I mentioned, all right? So the first guitarist up to bat tonight is Rory Gallagher. Now, Rory Gallagher never really attained mainstream success like some of the guitarists that we've already covered on the channel in the past. But you know, I first discovered Rory Gallagher in 1973 when he released his Tattoo album. I remember bringing it home and showing Showing it to my brother Gary. Gary, who is a fabulous singer-songwriter in his own right, loved him. And Rory Gallagher, to this day, is one of his very favorite guitar players. Now, Rory has everything that I was talking about. 
First of all, listen to his tone. He would set the tones in such a way that his guitar would stand out with a full band mix behind him without him having to really crank it to 11. Sorry, Spinal Tap. And he just amazed me. He was a basic blues player with a rock touch to me. You know, it was Eric Clapton who gave credit to Rory Gallagher for getting him back into the blues. So thanks, Rory, for that. And there is a story going around on the internet. Now, I don't know if this is true, but it should be. They once asked Jimi Hendrix, evidently, what it felt like to be the greatest guitar player in the world. He replied, I don't know, go ask Rory Gallagher. Now you'll find, especially in magazines like Guitar Player, just dozens of articles on this guy about how great he is, but then when the lists come out, thank you Rolling Stone, he just doesn't rank as high. So that covers Roy Gallagher, a very underappreciated guitar player in my view. Now the next guitar player that I want to bring up is in all those magazines that expose how wonderful of a guitarist he is, and yet in the lists he just doesn't seem to rise at the very cream of the crop, and that of course is Lindsey Buckingham. Now some people wouldn't even consider him because they see him more as a pop songwriter that belongs to more of a pop-oriented band, which is a load of BS because Fleawood Mac is far more than just another pop-oriented band. And in future videos, whether they make it to Olympus or not, I will be covering Fleetwood Mac, but not just the most popular lineup. You know what my favorite cut from Fleetwood Mac is? Hypnotized. Oh, the story that unfolds in my mind when I hear that song, it is just so wonderful. Was that Bob Welch? I'm just going off memory here right now, guys, and I'm not gonna look it up. Uh, let me know in the comments, all right? A wonderful song, wonderful song. But if you have any doubts about this guy as a guitar player, just take a look at their film when they got back in the early 2000s, right? And he takes center stage and he does a version of Big Love, as well as one of my favorite songs of all time, Go Insane. Watch those two performances, what, 15 minutes of that footage, and you'll be convinced this man is a virtuoso who just gets better as he ages. Okay, so next up is the lead guitarist for my favorite 90s band, and I've already told you that in a past video, and that is Alice in Chains, Mr. Jerry Cantrell. You know, when I first heard him, I go, yeah, he's like a a half cut better than all of the other guitarists of that genre. But you know, the more the band started exploring more acoustic sounds, that's when I realized this man has that vocabulary I'm talking about, right? It's with these recordings that he finally talked to me on a personal level. It's like, yes, I have something different to say with my guitar. Wonderful. Jerry Cantrell, not a mere craftsman, but an artist in every sense of the word. All right, next up, I've seen this guitarist live twice now, and that is Ronnie Montrose. You know, when I think of Ronnie Montrose, I think of pre-Eddie Van Halen. He is one of two guitarists in that small sliver of time that covered from original classic rock unto the new classic rock. And you know, he shared that spot with Robin Trower, and Robin Trower nearly met the list today, except I think that Robin Trower generally has gotten a whole lot more love on guitar lists, it seemed like. Now, number five, I'm either gonna get a lot of love on this choice, or I'm gonna get a lot of comments saying he doesn't belong on there at all. And of course, we're talking about George Harrison. Now, why is George Harrison even on a great guitarist list? Granted, he was in one of the great bands, but was he a guitar virtuoso? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the Beatles. When he showed up in the studio, you know, he loved Carl Perkins and the guitar riffs found on his songs. And of course, George knew them all, and he incorporated that sound with the Beatles. Now, the Beatles' total sound would change that almost rockabilly sound into a slightly more rock and roll. And yes, you can say that approach by George Harrison aged fairly soon, and it did, and George went into a uncomfortable period in the mid beatle period. He even said that was part of the reason he didn't think he had much to offer as a guitar player, so he started studying sitar at that point. But you know, after a while of studying the sitar, he said he knew he would never be as good as just a real good sitar player. There were thousands of just merely real good sitar players that he would never be 
able to approach. So that's when he decided to start getting back in to being a guitarist. It had been a couple of years at that point. So what did he do? Well, you can see there was some uncomfortable periods there with even Paul McCartney taking over soloing for the Beatles during that period especially, right? But by the time of the White Album, a little bit with Let It Be, but especially with Abbey Road, George Harrison's new sound arrived. Now I'm talking about his exploration in playing slide guitar. You know, his whole approach is different than most slide guitar players. Most slide players tune to like an E chord or some basic open chord and then play the slide around that. It provides a more easy access to more traditional blues runs that way. A very smart way to approach slide guitar, but George Harrison didn't approach slide guitar that way. You see, his guitar wasn't tuned to an open E or another chord or any other way. He used standard tuning. Now, I'm not a great slide guitarist at all, but I have provided some slide guitar tracks, and I gotta tell you, two out of three of them are always the way George Harrison does it. First of all, I'm not good enough with that Delta down home blue slide kind of thing anyway, but what I do like about standard tuning is that it allows for a more melodic approach. You can reach the notes in an easier fashion and you can go into different modes, everything. Now, I'm not comparing George Harrison's slide work to Dwayne Allman's. No, not at all. But listen to the two of them. Basically, these are the two prime examples, two most well-known approaches to slide guitar in pop rock history. You've got the down-home, delta, let's get it down, dirty, gritty blues of Dwayne Allman, and you've got the more melodic, but unmistakable sound of George Harrison. Unmistakable, I say? Yes, indeed. How many of you instantly recognize George's guitars on certain Badfinger recordings? And regarding his most magnificent album, All Things Must Pass, that thumbprint is all over that baby, and he had left it starting with Abbey Road. Now, you know, uh, to me, George Harrison is a man who just never quit. He saw his own limitations and he worked around them, sometimes through them. So whatever you think of George Harrison's proudness as a guitar player, he left a pretty big footprint in the path of rock and roll, if you ask me. We've discussed who my favorite bands are, and I'm even having a lot of fun by placing them in a mythical Mount Olympus. I've named the Beatles as Zeus, of course. I've identified Led Zeppelin as Poseidon, and I know there's some of you out there that think that they should be Hades, a point well taken. But since they are my number two, and Poseidon was generally considered number two in power, I stand by my decision. And of course, in the Hades position, I have placed Pink Floyd. All right, so we've already talked about the big three, and I've already identified several other Olympian level bands, and that list is on my channel page, by the way. So I wanna make it real clear here. These Olympian level bands, these are bands that have been so important to me musically that I not only see them as co-equals to my top three choices, but there are times when I prefer to listen to one of these bands or three of these bands at a time over listening to even the Beatles, the mighty Led Zeppelin, or the curiously placed Pink Floyd. These are the bands who exist on Mount Rock Olympus, folks. And so here's where I tie it all together. You see a couple of the guitarists that we will be discussing tonight actually are members of these two bands that I'm about to announce. The first band I want to announce, I've almost pre-announced it several times, but I do want to place this band right on Olympus, right next to Yes, right next to Queen, right next to the Brothers Three. And curiously, this is yet another English band, but it's not a band that's known for being a band of the 60s or the 70s, even though their first couple of albums came out in the late 70s. Generally, they're looked at as either one of the top 80s bands or the top 80s bands separated from classic rock. But you know, I disagree with that. Everything about The Police is classic rock, and we'll discuss them later. So that's band number six out of 13. Remember my loophole, folks. Hades gets a pass. Since we've included him, there are still 12 other Olympian bands. And now we have six. No, not six, but seven. And for the first time on my list, 
In Comes, my first American band. Now, for those of you who have been astute enough to look at my About page occasionally, I always provide a hint for my next Olympian level band. Okay, so enough of the buildup. My choice for Olympian level band number seven, Steely Dan. All right, so I'm gonna cover my reasons in the next few videos as to why I chose these next two bands, but believe me, I've put a lot of thought into this. And remember, I always have a few rules about these Olympian level bands. Either they have done things that are just so undeniable, like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin, as far as ruling an entire decade unto themselves, or they are a genre creating band, and to my ears are the best example of that genre. For prog rock, I've chosen yes, right? For my ultimate psychedelic band, it would be Pink Floyd, although they're not often seen as a psychedelic band. I just think they took psychedelia where it should have gone and people just quit calling it that. So I'll be getting into the reasons why the police belong at the table. And I'll also, of course, give you my reasons, especially concerning Steely Dan. I have some specific reasons why that band is on this list. And you know, only one of those very specific reasons is the magnificent guitar playing of Larry Carlton. You know, when Steely Dan first came out, I thought Denny Diaz was doing half of the solos that he wasn't doing. I of course loved Jeff Skunk Baxter, but you know over the years as I would re-listen to these albums, and I did often, I found out that it was often Larry Carlton who provided the solo that I really love. You know guys, this man's not just a virtuoso, which he is, there is no doubt about that, but he has what I talked about in my last video. He has a vocabulary. He goes places that your average jazz guitarist wouldn't think of going. And guess what? He writes those solos, and then these very complicated solos will just ask any Steely Dan fan if they could imagine any other solo or any vamping or the changing of the solo other than what they've heard on the album. They know their music that well. And I'm gonna cheat here a bit because I'm gonna give you another guitarist who's underappreciated and he almost made the list, except that I had to give it to this guy, right? But how about the excellent solo on Kings by this band on their first album? Randall Elliott to the rescue. I used to think that was Denny Diaz, and I was so wrong. So anyway, there's the two for the price of one that I offered you in my last video when I compared Ronnie Montrose and Robin Trower. Now, as you could tell in my last video, not all of my choices are necessarily riff masters. And if you've watched any of my past videos, you know I'm a fan of riff masters. Riff masters are wonderful. I could just listen to a guy talk to me by riffing away the evening all night. And there are gonna be a couple of guitarists that offer something extra, and we'll talk about that later. But here is a riff master for you, Johnny Winter. Man, if you ever asked me for, just give me the best smokehouse, blues-based, rock, classic sound with guitar in your face, this is the guy I'd send him to. You know, when he was hot, when he was real popular, he would rank as high as number one on certain lists. And you know, his whole genre was real popular for five, 10 years, and he survived very well on that. But it seems to me he's almost become a specialty act when these lists are put together. Oh yeah, Johnny over there at the Roadhouse. What a load of crap. This man is a riff master. This man tells a tale when he solos. This man sings his heart out, and he doesn't know when to stop. And as far as being a Showman? Ah, man, the guy's got it all covered. Mr. Johnny Winter. All right, so if you remember in my last video, I kind of predicted that there may be those who would not agree with my choice of George Harrison even being on a great guitarist list at all. And my next choice for this list is another guitarist that some may feel don't belong on a great 
guitarist list, and I thoroughly disagree. And that, of course, is Andy Summers. You know, in fact, when I listen to Andy's body of work, I hear George Harrison on steroids. This is the chordal approach that early George supplied for the Beatles, absolutely orchestrating, for the most part, the entire police. And when he multi-layers his pieces, it's wonderful. But when you watch him live, the pieces he chooses to play, the man is just a fantastic guitarist. And quite literally, one third of the police them being a rare band where all members are vital. Okay, so my next one does get love in lists, but not high enough as far as I'm concerned. And that's the mighty Brian May of Queen. You know, as I've said before, I've seen Queen live on two occasions, and I just couldn't believe at the time that a guitarist could perform all of that sound live in front of me. When I found out later that he was responsible for putting together and constructing not only his own guitar, but devices that he could use so that he could overlay his guitar parts live. That just put him slightly ahead of Joe Walsh, who was known to be tinkering with what you could do electronically with a guitar. You know, it was George Martin who said that one of his main things that he thought he taught the Beatles was to teach them to think symphonically. Brian May is the most symphonic, heavy metal at times, barbershop quartet at others, guitarist that I've ever seen in my life. No, no, no. Brian May needs to be bumped up in the list, guys, way up. Now, I don't know if my next choice is gonna be very controversial or not. I know this next guitarist has a lot of fans and he's recognized as a truly great artist in general. But guitar fans who prefer riff masters over, say, a total guitar experience, they may not put him very high on their list. And I'm talking about David Gilmour. You know, it was a friend of mine that pointed me into the direction of B.B. King, because B.B. King had kind of a too mellow style for me to really appreciate at that time. And he said, listen to how that man feels his way through his licks. He's not the fastest riffer. He's not doing anything that five or six other great blues guitarists wasn't doing currently, but none of them had his feel. David Gilmore is Rock's answer to B.B. King in my personal opinion. And with Gilmore, you not only get that touch, that feel like B.B. had with the blues, but you also get a guitar player who thinks orchestrationally, approaching his guitar licks to orchestrate the song, to benefit it. And of course, he's got some pretty badass licks himself. But to me, it's David Gilmore who took rock god guitar status in a slightly different direction. That makes him a genre establisher in my book. Okay, so there you go. There's my choice, six for the price of five, folks. And if you think about it, 12 for the price of 10 with the past two videos. All right, so that about wraps up my top 10 with a couple of bonuses thrown in for you. Most underrated guitarists of rock and roll, in my opinion.